So we're going to continue the boring molecular orbital problem by developing the group orbital and the shape and magnitude of the group orbital uh, from the projection operator method using the answer we generated in part two of this series. So this was already derived earlier, um, as, we, uh, as we said before. And those projections of HA throughout all the operations in the series now need to be multiplied by the second EREP that we determined uh, was the symmetry of the group orbital. And in this particular case, it's E prime. So following through exactly what we were doing before, multiplying through HA times two gives you HA, and then HB times minus one gives you minus HB. And then of course, HC times minus one is minus HC. Anytime you see zeros, the zeros are effectively carried through. And then as, as you can also tell, this then repeats itself again. Okay, so the, the sum of, of that particular EREP now gives you um, E prime is now four HA. Now it says minus two HB minus two HC. So what that means is that the phasing of, of HA is actually positive and the phasings on HB and HC are actually negative. Um, so that's just illustrated here again by filling in um, the positive areas and then leaving um, the negative areas or the negative phasings open. And the magnitudes of them are effectively four here, two here, and two here. So you can kind of see, I'm, I'm tempting to make this look twice as big as this one here, twice as big as, as these, but I didn't quite hit the mark um, on that. Um, but needless to say, that is the shape of the E prime Y group orbital. And I say that um, simply because it has the symmetry of the, of the Y axis where if you have X and Y, um, when you point through the origin here, um, Y is positive and then below the origin, Y is, is negative, exactly the phasing that you see in that particular group orbital. So let's kind of continue this process on the next page and, and really remember where we were. We have the um, symmetries of the group orbitals have to be A1 prime plus E. We determined um, what the shape of A1 prime is earlier in part two. Um, we just completed what E prime Y looks like. Now we have to figure out what the other degenerate orbital um, or degenerate group orbital will look like here. And for this approach, we have to use what's known as normalization. So when you're using normalization, um, what does that mean? Well, in essence, we have to normalize um, the group orbitals. The good news for us is the atomic orbitals that are constructing the group orbitals all of the atomic orbitals are already normalized. And remember what this means. It's basically the integral of the wave function over all space. The probability of finding that electron is 100% or one. And that is what we're doing. If we draw the group orbitals correctly, um, they in the end have to also be normalized and they're gonna take different weightings of the components of the different 1s orbitals that, that put them or uh, that compose them in the first place. So let's go through this process. So now if we think about what the, uh, what the wave function of the A1 prime group orbital looks like, really what you have to wind up doing is we have to normalize it. So in the end, you effectively have different coefficients um, for each of the wave function components that are in here. And remember, um, for this one, this is simply um, this particular 
wave function. So it's really just the 1s orbital. And then for, you know, the 1s of HB, we're really saying like, what is the, you know, what is the composition or what is the fraction of HB that will be in the, in the final group orbital? And then of course, the last one here is, um, is HC. And again, that is what we're trying to determine. So to simplify all of this terminology, what I did was just decided to do, um, you know, phi A and phi B and phi C to use those as shorthands for this more complex looking mathematical expression. So in the end, what do we have? Well, we have this wave function that has a coefficient in front of it. And then we basically have the, um, the sum that we determined here. And if you remember that sum was determined from the analysis that we did from generating the group orbitals in the first place through the projection operator method. So what's next? The next step here, sorry about that. Next step is going to be now we have to normalize. So to normalize, what we're going to do is we literally have to take this wave function. I apologize for that. Let me come back here a little bit. Sorry. Okay. So what we have to do is we, in essence, have to take that entire wave function and square it. So why do we square it? Because then the probability of finding the electron in that new group orbital wave function has to have a probability of 100% or um, integrated, normalized, um, has to have an integral that's one. So the way that this process works is, as you can see, what I simply did is you, if you square this term and substitute it um, down in here, this is, um, this is basically what we get. And then that whole, that whole um, integral has to be equal to one. And remember, this is a constant, so it doesn't get integrated. And then if you just break it up into its individual components and you do that square, um, squaring it gives you actually nine terms, but six of them, uh, which are overlap terms, are zero. So we're just going to ignore it. Um, but basically, in the end, you, you basically get now, um, you know, phi A squared plus phi B squared plus phi C squared um, is equal to one. And then the good news here is, is that if we sort of just look at what all those coefficients are um, that are in front of, of phi A, phi B, and phi C, they're all ones. And because they're all ones, they wind up coming down in here as, as effectively all ones. So you can see what happens then. It's C squared times one plus one plus one is then equal to one, which in the end, if you basically then just solve the problem, um, you know, effectively, you know, C squared will be one over uh, one over three, and then you have to take the square root of both sides, and then that just basically gives you C over the root three, which is what's shown here. So that's the coefficient now that winds up going in this particular case right into the front of that wave function. And then that's the, that's the normalization uh, constant, C. So then the normalization constant, when included in this discussion, then suddenly gives you now this one over root three multiplied times uh, the, that entire group orbital wave function. So that is now normalized. So the way that you know this is normalized is if you think about it, if you square each of these, um, if you square the coefficient that's in front of here, basically one over root three and you square it, that's one third. And then do the same thing for, for, um, for phi b, and then do the same thing for phi c. You see how that's one third, one third, and one third. So the sum of that whole um, thing is, or the sum of that whole, uh, group orbital is one, and then that basically is the normalization condition. So you can say that that wave function is now normalized. 